everybody. Welcome back. I'm always glad you are back and uh, I'm looking forward to this show because today uh, we're, I'm going to discuss with you, uh, oh, please subscribe. I always want to remember that. I, I hope you subscribe to the show and I hope, again, I always hope you enjoy our conversations. So today we're, I'm going to talk about individual plants, kind of why uh, some of the plant choices that I've, I use on a regular basis and what characteristics of each plant has uh, I found joy with and, and, and happiness. And I would like to kind of discuss that with you and start with the two questions that I like to begin the show with. And one is, as you come to know a plant, do you focus on all its characteristics that enable countless planting opportunities? There's more than just bloom time and flower color. And you know, I know you know all that. I, I know, I, I think you all have a sense it's more than just bloom time and flower color. But it's even uh, what I've mentioned earlier, it's the way as the sun moves through the sky, the way light reflects off the foliage from morning till dark. And the other question is, what conventionally considered characteristics have caused, caused traditional plantings to decline on such a large scale. When you look at most of our perennial plantings, they have a shelf life. And I've, I realize that a lot of the plantings are just geared towards the ribbon cutting. If they look good to, at the ribbon cutting or when they're introduced or initially put in, after that traditional herbaceous plant or perennial plantings just begin to decline because the plants selected don't know how to relate to each other. And when they relate to each other in a more uh, aggressive way, plants decline and expand quickly and you bec it becomes a garden of maybe four or five species. So we have to look at what are those characteristics that have caused that to be done so, so, so poorly, actually. And it's simply not understand or understanding all the characteristics of the plant. And I'd like to share with you a list I created called the Appropriate Perennial Plant List. And you can get this list if you go online to Northwind Perennial Farm. You can print it out. It's simply a group of plants I've used that have lived modestly well in our region and have a, have a forgiving nature in our soils. Our soils are uh, heavy clay soils with a lot of cobbles, glacial debris in them. They drain well, but yet they retain moisture at a, a modest or high, higher level in the spring. And you, can, and you can find so much diverse information about the plants I'm going to share with you coming up online and all of you know that anything you want to look up you can find online so I'm not going to go into too much detail about the plants except for some of the stronger characteristics and personal observations that I've had and you only and you'll only come to know each plant and each plant will only come to new, know you when you plant it in the ground there's you can't read enough about a plant and know anything about it it's just going to give you a general feeling so you can understand you want to actually have the plant and grow it in the ground. It's simply like, uh, like I, some classes, they learn 150 plants alphabetically, they go through it, they take a test, the students are scared to death, they memorize everything. By the time the class is over, they can't name 10 of the plants. I had a group that I asked them to tell me about Echinacea purpurea, they gave me bloom time and a rough flower color. They couldn't tell me texture of the foliage, emergence rate, what does the plant do from April to mid-June, how tall does it get? They didn't have any of that knowledge. They didn't come to know the plant, they just kind of knew it alphabetically. When I was in high school, I couldn't get out of high school until I, I had to know the presidents in 1971. You had a, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Adams, Jackson, Van Buren, Harrison, Tyler, Polk, Taylor, Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, Lincoln, John. What did I learn? I didn't learn anything about him. I, don't, I can't tell you anything Millard Fillmore did. Yet there's something in his presidency that probably affects my life right now. If we were to come to know the presidents, what they did, how it affected life at that time and how it still affects life now, that has so much more value on how I can make decisions about future people I vote for or future presidents. So it's coming to know that has such value. So once, once you're introduced to a plant, befriend it. So here's some of the plants that I'd like to share with you. I start off with an Achillea hybrid, it's called Heliglashoff. It's not commonly found, 
And simply, I like Hella Glashoff. It's beautiful dark green foliage, fern-like foliage. But the great characteristic is his vertical stems are strong. And you can see in this image, even when there's not a plant holding it up, when it leans over, the stems are strong. Has beautiful butter yellow flowers that are very easy for most people to look at and appreciate. The flowers go from butter yellow to creamy yellow to dark brown. And architecturally, it holds up very well and does nicely in our, again, heavy clay soils. It's been, out of all the Achilleas, except Coronation Gold is fairly durable, Hella Glashoff has done very well from year to year. In fact, in Fontana, it's been in a, it's been in a boulevard. Uh, it can't be a harder place to live than in a boulevard on Highway 67. It's been in that boulevard since 2009. That's 11 years it's done well in a boulevard. Then the next, so the next plant is Agastache, hybrid Blue Fortune. Blue Fortune has a persistent nature about it, more than some other Agastache, and yet it can die in some very wet winters. It can be short-lived. It doesn't, it doesn't freely seed, but I like Agastache Blue Fortune. Simply it has the right height for mixing in with so many plants. And here you see it in combination with Calamagrostis Carl Forster. So it, it's one of my many favorite plants to use. And I can interplant again, if it's not Carl Forster, I can drift it through some Coreopsis Verticillata Golden Showers at varying percentages. And again, endless combinations of use. The next plant uh, is Allium angulosum Summer Beauty. I can't begin to tell you how many different patterns I can create with Summer Beauty. Again, it's the persistent green foliage. The foliage isn't brown at the tips. That's a strong characteristic. And the other characteristic is it doesn't set viable seed. I found this plant in a guy's backyard in 96. And I asked him, I said, where's all your seedlings? He said, he didn't think it reseeded. And I, I was growing in Allium Montanum at the time, had similar flowers, but the leaves turned brown and, and the plant seeded everywhere. It would chase you down. You'd have to, if you had it at your house, you had to sell your house and move on because you couldn't get rid of the thing. And this Allium Summer Beauty, when he told me it didn't reseed, I said, you got a problem. I'm not leaving your property until you give me three pieces of that plant. So in 96, he gave me a piece. It didn't set viable seed. And I introduced it into the Midwest Ground Covers catalog. And at one point in year 2000, we were doing 12 to 14,000 a year. And I always had a fear it could become Rebecca Goldstrom. I have such empathy for Rebecca Goldstrom because everybody used it everywhere. It became the plant to go to. Massive groups of Rebecca, which caused it to develop Septoria leaf spot, and that plant is on total decline. Really, you shouldn't use Rebecca Goldstrom anywhere. There's so many better varieties that don't get the Septoria leaf spot. Rebecca Goldstrom, we should all pitch in, all of us, because it helped us become profitable. We should buy Rudbeckia Goldstrom a little chalet on the Gulf of Mexico and let it retire there. Let it have a nice time, get it a pontoon boat or something. Just let it, let it be for a while. Viet's Little Susie, American Gold Rush, on and on. There's so many nice Rudbeckias you can use. So you see Allium Summer Beauty mingled with Echinacea. Uh, which one is that? Echinacea Prairie Splendor, and then Allium Summer Beauty mingled with Oregano Herrenhausen, which is a nice combination. They're all easy combinations to mingle together. The next plant is Amsonia Tabernae Montana Salicifolia. I got this plant from Pete Outoff from Seed, and he got the seed, he told me, from someone in England is where it was found. Simply, it has dark stems when it emerges from the ground. So the stems are kind of a blackish gray and maintains dark stems until midsummer where they're dark green. And it's a nice shrubby plant, but again, you can look all that up online. And you see in the next few images, it makes a great structural plant for the Stachys humulo and Calamintha mingled together. So it's very architectural and takes up space conveniently. It will reseed, but either you just hoe the seedlings out when you see them coming up. And you see it in one, in the next picture, emerging with tulips. And look at the foliage coming out of the ground, the darker stems, and the way it mixes so nicely with the tulips. 
Fall color is tremendous. Yellow, bright yellow fall color, you see that in the next image. So it's a very outgoing plant in the fall. And the next plant is a Runcus hybrid, Horatio. I got that from Pete for the Lurie Garden in Millennium Park. That was introduced by Ernst Pagels. Simply, it doesn't get septoria leaf spot. Our own native Aruncus dioicus, I, I grow and I can't, I, I continually spray in production for septoria leaf spot. And I found where Aruncus dioicus lives. I went on the Vermilion River at Matheson State Park in uh, north central Illinois. And I found Aruncus dioicus growing in the ravines of the Vermilion River. And there it had shade, it had the cooling breezes blowing through the rock ravines. It doesn't get septoria leaf spot. When you put it in the garden with the heat of summer, overly irrigated and moisture, you, you promote septoria leaf spot. Well, Runcus Horatio doesn't have that situation. So it's a great introduction from Ernst Pagels. And it fills space nicely and it's sterile and doesn't reseed either. So it doesn't give you uh, work. And the next plant is plant, I can't find it anywhere. It's very limited in its use, but it's so good. It's Boltoni Asteroides James Crockett, named after James Crockett, who had Vic Crockett's Victory Garden. Mounding plant, very little receding compared to Calamira's Blue Star, so it doesn't dominate an area. And here you see it with Sprobulus heterolepis. It's beautifully drifted through a garden, gives you great summer shades of blue in July. Next plant we've already talked about is Calamenta nepeta, subspecies nepeta, a German introduction. Again, sterile. And that's going to get a bit confusing in the trade now because they're introducing a lot of Calamenta nepetas, and the possibilities are they are not sterile like Calamenta nepeta, subspecies nepeta. So if you get confused and you want to make sure you get Calamenta nepeta, subspecies nepeta, it has glossy foliage, it's not pubescent. The other Calamenta's that are pubescent foliage tend to reseed everywhere. So before you buy other introductions, simply buy another calamint if you like it. Put it in your vegetable garden. Grow it there and see how it will perform and see if it's going to have that reseeding capability that can be a complete nuisance in the garden early in its age, age within other plants. And here's calamint, and here's a, one, a beautiful combination of gentiana and drusii bottle gentian. This melts people's heart. This is out at Lurie Garden. When these bottle gentian bloom with the beautiful blue, looks like beautiful thumbs coming through the calamintha. And the gentian, the calamintha allows enough sunlight to come through as they're maturing so the gentian can collect enough sunlight to stay strong and maintain a healthy life as it grows through the calamintha. Well, breaking news. Hold on everybody, we got a breaking news story. I see this on TV so much. I have to, it's part of my life now, it's breaking news. And it's now for something really special. I want to share a brief moment with you right now before we get into the heart of spring. Carex, their future is now. The sedges, as you can see in the few images, have played a vital role. They were everywhere. They were the understory plant of our, here in the Kettle Marine of all our woodlands with sedge communities. They changed, they affected the soil moisture so oaks could root out healthy and leaf out healthier. They shaded the soil, they, their roots penetrated deep into the earth, they mingled and knit together, the spring ephemerals could come through them in a communal lifestyle. And I have a visual here, the practical influence of Carex. There's so many ways sedges contribute to, as I mentioned, the health of the woody plants, and the other component is their communal lifestyle. You can interplant plants with them three years later, five years later, six years later. Some will knit together tighter. Carex pennsylvanica will knit together tighter in a short period of time. So you might have three year window to plant plants in between them. And you can put plants in that come through them, like hostas, like calophyllum, semisifugas, potophyllum, mayapples. It's just a, a wonderful plant to cover the earth. And you can see it used and a, I call it a suppression garden as a living mulch under woody plants. At the Art Institute, I put it in one of the areas where it's mingled in this one image with hosta halcyon. 
And Jerry Wilhelm, who I mentioned in an earlier show, had this wonderful thought. I said, Jerry, what's something you would like to try? He said, Roy, I'd like to take a young oak tree, maybe a two-inch caliper, put it in the earth, and around the drip line of that oak tree, put in plants that that oak has lived with since it appeared on earth, in the companionship of sedges and other spring ephemerals. And as the oak tree gets bigger and larger, as the drip line gets larger, keep planting the sedges out amongst the drip line of the tree. So here you can see an image of Jerry's done that, and you can see the sedges interplanting with other spring ephemerals with the oak. And that oak tree will never know on a healthy day in its life because it's living in the company of every plant it's ever lived with since it appeared on Earth. And as you increase it each year, in 5, 10, 15 years, you might have six, 700 square feet of a a sedge planting around the oak. And then as you see in this one picture, you can have your own little burn, your own little fire, because th this situation always lived in the company of fire. Um, so that's where we're at right now. I wanted to get that little brief section of Carrickson. And as we get outside, we're gonna walk through uh, woodland areas. We're gonna look at Carrick's production to see how we're growing them. And we're going to get diversity in sedges. You don't want to plant a monoculture of Carex pennsylvanica everywhere because then we're just duplicating vinca. We're doing something healthier because of the depth and vigor of the root systems of Carex, but we're not creating anything healthier than just a monoculture of one thing. So always think diversity. And I leave you with that thought. I'll see you next time. And uh, good to be with you. Oh, and please subscribe if you have a moment. That's too good. Bye.